This video discusses dilemmas of remarried and recoupled families and some rules for understanding and avoiding the pitfalls step families often fall into. The first thing to understand about remarried families is that while they look like once partnered families, they do not have the same history and thus their relationships are not the same. We all carry at least one set of baggage into our first marriages, the emotional baggage of unresolved issues from our family of origin and all important previous relationships. Remarried families are built on loss. In remarriages, there are at least three sets of emotional baggage from the family of origin, from the first marriage, and from the process and aftermath of separation, divorce, or death and the period in between marriages. The new step family comes into being because two people fall in love, at least one of whom already has children with another partner, thus creating the complexity. The strength of this new couple's relationship is central to the new family working. Without the couple having a solid bond, the new family will not succeed. So it requires our primary attention. It is also likely to be a fragile relationship because of its newness and because of all the prior commitments to children and family members that must be realigned to make the new family work. Forming a step family requires giving up forever the concept of simple or clear family membership and boundaries, which is no easy task. Once a remarried family is formed, it becomes forever impossible to have a clear definition, if it is ever possible anyway, of who exactly is related to you how. The boundary ambiguities and complexities include issues of membership, space, authority, finances, and allocation of time. For example, John was the only child of his parents. After John's parents divorced, his mother remarried. How will he connect to his new stepfather's family and how will they relate to him? Are the new stepfather's cousins now John's cousins? Another issue is that his new stepfather has two daughters from a previous marriage who spend some time with him. How will they adjust to that changing household membership and how will they learn to be a family when they are together? How will they share space and time? How will John deal with going from being an only child to being the middle of three surrounded by two sisters? On the other front, John's father then remarried a woman who herself has two sons from a previous marriage. Would John get to have a room of his own in his father's house when he was there only twice a week, while his father's stepchildren were there every day? And who would get to make the rules for John when he came to his father and stepmother's home? In terms of allocation of time, who would get to spend more time with John's father, his own child, or his stepchildren? And how would John deal with the shift from being his father's only child to being now the youngest of three sons on this side of the family? And when it comes to finances, who will decide whether John gets to go to private college while his step-siblings go to public college because their parents together cannot afford private college. Furthermore, when he becomes a young adult, will he have the option to move back home with his mother and stepfather if it is the stepfather who is supporting John's mother and paying for the house? And who will inherit from John's parents and stepparents? An additional boundary problem arises when instant incest taboos are called for as when several previously unrelated teenagers are suddenly expected to view each other as siblings, which may soon become a problem for John and his step-siblings. All these ambiguities of relationship, membership, space, authority, and time are built in and can never again be clearly defined. Divorce and remarriage have become normal life experiences in the United States. More than half of the people in the U.S. today have been, are now, or will eventually be in one or more recoupled families during their lives, though the patterns depend on social class, age, race, and gender. 
which include the frequently recoupling families of the poor who can rarely afford marriage and have, as Linda Burton has described, frequently changing constellations of mothers, other mothers, and only sometimes fathers and other fathers in the picture. In any case, earlier losses are very likely to be reactivated by the new family formation. Because step-family relationships involve not only adding new members, but also a rearrangement of many parts of the previous family, becoming a family together will take time. It takes time to adjust to the built-in complexities of remarried families so they can work to establish a viable, flexible system and get back on their developmental track. Family members must coordinate many different parts of their ongoing families to create the new family, which always takes time. At its best, about two to three years. And if the family doesn't get together until the children are teenagers, they may never really bond together. The basic reason for this is that remarried families form because two parents fall in love and decide to get together. The new family is a package deal originating from one partner loving and committing to another who already has children. This is the package. Because the spouse's children are a package, a level of benign kindness and generosity to the spouse's children is essential to the arrangement. But nothing more than that should be expected, and the couple will need to build a relationship that is strong enough to manage the complexities, which is where clinical support may be necessary, not with the children or the ex-spouse, but with the couple. If only we could help people to have respect for the basic nature of their relationships and honor the package deal aspect of a choice of a new spouse and all the family members he comes already packaged with. Pressure tends to be put especially on stepmothers to love their stepchildren, but this is an unreasonable expectation. That they are polite and unobtrusive is important. But love is another story altogether and not ever to be expected. If it develops, the family is very fortunate. But especially if the new couple doesn't meet until the children are teenagers, it is quite unlikely to develop and no one should ever expect it or try to demand it. If there are struggles and conflicts in the remarried family, the place to start the repair is with the couple themselves. Without their bond, there would be no family. So that is the relationship that needs to be solid and strong. The most complex remarried families, where both spouses bring children from previous relationships, tend to have the greatest difficulty establishing stability. The longer the new family has together as a unit, the more likely they are to develop a sense of family integration. In this family, for example, Tom's first wife, Alice, had died leaving him with their daughter, Sandra, and now he has married Joan, who already has four children. Joan and her four young children she had with her ex-husband, Joe, and she now shares custody of them while dealing with her stepdaughter, Sandra, whom she says hates her. Joe and Joan share custody of their four young children, and he and his wife, Tanya, have a new baby. Tanya has never been married before, and now has a baby and four young stepchildren for whom she is a sometime stepmother. The system's transformation involved for forming a stepfamily requires an entirely new paradigm of family with much more flexible boundaries. But when one has been through the pain of the first family ending, it is easy to understand the wish for clear and quick boundary closing around the new family. However, the instant intimacy that remarried families generally hope for is impossible to achieve. Step-family relationships are harder to negotiate because they do not develop gradually as they do in first families. They begin midstream after another family's life cycle has been dislocated by separation, divorce, or premature death. While more advanced planning would be helpful also for first marriages, it is an essential ingredient for successful remarriage because so many family relationships must be renegotiated at the same time, including grandparents, in-laws, former in-laws, 
step-grandparents and stepchildren, half-siblings, aunts, uncles, friends, and community. The presence of children from the beginning of the new relationship makes establishing an exclusive spouse-to-spouse -spouse relationship before undertaking parenthood impossible. Our society offers stepfamilies two basic models, neither of which works. The media glorifies families that act like the Brady Bunch, where everybody lives together happily ever after, and there are no dangling ends. But there are always dangling ends. And one of the biggest problems remarried families have to contend with is society's expectations that they will blend and live happily ever after, which is the most unreasonable expectation. The alternative is the concept of evil stepmothers, etc. History and legend are replete with stories of evil stepmothers, vicious and sexual predator stepfathers, self-centered stepsisters, incompetent stepbrothers, obnoxious and unruly stepchildren, etc., etc., etc. And therapists make fortunes of money listening to stepmothers complain about their stepchildren and young people complain about their step-parents. The negative connotations of the kinship terms we do have for step-families undoubtedly increase the difficulties that families have living in these multinuclear families, where children may be part of not just two, but often three or four household constellations at one time. Just because you fall in love with a person doesn't mean you automatically love their children. So how do you decide to take on a new family in mid-journey just because they are there and part of your spouse's life? That is often the hardest part of the bargain. The first thing is to conceptualize and plan for remarriage as a long and complex process. And as we said, there are always dangling ends. The children's loyalties to and connection with their other parent, the parents longing for his children who now live elsewhere with the other parent, as well as lingering conflicts between the ex-spouses or longing for a spouse who has died or left. Families must also manage the stress of absorbing two or three generations of new members into the system and redefining their roles and relationships with the pre-existing family members. The built-in ambiguity of boundaries and membership in remarried families defy simple definition, and our culture lacks language or rituals to help us handle the complex relationships of acquired family members. Because parent-child bonds predate the new marital bonds, often by many years, and are therefore initially stronger than the couple bond, Remarried families must allow for the built-in ambiguity of roles and the differential ties based on their historical connections. A parent who comes along once children are already embarked on their life cycle with different parents will have to acknowledge the lack of history with the new children and build a relationship with those children from scratch. And this is often in the face of the children having no interest whatever in building a relationship with an additional new parent. So the new spouse will have to make space for the children's prior connection to their other parent or parents in whatever ongoing ways are required. And as already mentioned, the later in the life cycle the new couple gets together, the less connection the new partner will probably develop with the new children. And if they're over 12, it may not happen at all or not until years later in adulthood. Stepmothers tend to get the worst deal in remarried families, frequently being viewed as superficial, self-centered, and not as good as the original mother. The issue here is actually structural. We often say that if the stepmother were God, she couldn't do it right. But the difficulty for stepmothers is especially poignant. They are typically expected to make up to children for whatever losses they have experienced, which is of course impossible. Clinically, it is important to relieve them of these expectations. We always recommend that stepmothers go on vacation from parenting and never take on or be given the role of primary parent or limit setter 
for their stepchildren. The only parent to be in charge of children is their primary parent, the one who has the history with them and thus the leverage, no matter what arrangements of finances and logistics it entails. Societal expectations of stepmothers to love and care for their stepchildren are also stronger than for stepfathers. If stepfathers help out a bit financially and do a few administrative chores, they may be viewed as an asset, even though that is not a satisfactory parental role. They may get caught in the bind between rescuer and intruder, called upon to help discipline the stepchildren and then criticized for their intervention. Over trying by the new parent, whether father or mother, is a major problem, often related to guilt about unresolved or unresolvable aspects of the family's new constellation. But for a stepmother, to stay on the sidelines may be especially difficult. She's likely to be the one most sensitive to the needs of others, and it will be extremely difficult for her to take a back seat while her husband struggles awkwardly in an uncomfortable situation, but there is no real alternative. The major problem for women in remarried families is how not to take responsibility for family relationships, how not to think that whatever goes wrong is their fault, and how to give up on the belief that if they try hard enough, they can make things work. One stepmother came to therapy complaining that her husband accused her of loving her dog more than her stepdaughter. Of course she did. Her dog loves her back every day of the week, and she and the dog already have a long loving history, while the stepdaughter acts rude and resentful viewing the stepmother as intruding on her relationship with her father. So the rule is, never have the expectation that a stepmother love her stepchildren, only that she be polite and gracious. Indeed, if you really want to help a step family, as we often say, take a stepmother to lunch. Step families need to prepare for several key issues, including finances, time and space, the ambiguity of roles, and dangling ends of other relationships. The first rule of thumb might be follow the money. Of course, that rule applies to most families, but money is often a particular problem and conflict in remarried families. Remarriage often reopens the financial battles of the divorce, and children may indeed receive less support and time from their biological fathers after remarriage. The fact that both parents usually enter remarriage with significant financial obligations to the first family can wreak havoc on families. And having multiple households is also likely to increase family expense and stress. It is also problematic if the step parent is contributing financially to the family's support, but does not have an equal voice in how the money is spent. There is, of course, a natural built-in triangle between the step-parent who is participating in the support of stepchildren and children whose loyalties will naturally tend towards the parent or parents rather than toward the step-parent. Remarriage, of course, entangles partners with each other's prior commitments and responsibilities, particularly for children, which the parent cannot, of course, ignore. A new wife may complain about the money her husband gives to his children, particularly if she's not receiving child support owed her for her children. Another problem, sometimes related to finances, is when one part of the family moves into a home which has been previously established solely by the other. This can leave a stepmother in the home of the original family, perhaps decorated by the previous spouse, in which she feels completely an outsider. Or, if the home is hers, she may be living with stepchildren in her home who do not appreciate her or her decorations. In terms of issues of time, space, ambiguity of roles and belonging, and the dangling ends of other relationships, there is always a sense of discombobulation for anyone whose family live in multiple households. And children always feel a conflict of loyalties, 
no matter what has been said to them about the loss of their parents being together. They typically worry about and long for the parent they are not with and feel guilty if they are happy with the one, fearing the other is not happy. Neither parents nor children nor grandparents forget the relationships that went before and that may still be more powerful than the new relationships. Children almost never give up their attachment to their first parent, no matter how negative that relationship has been. Having the patience to tolerate the ambiguity of the situation and allowing each other the space and time for feelings about the past relationships are crucial processes in forming a remarried family. Holidays may become a time of special difficulty as children typically wish the whole family could be together and are in pain no matter what sharing arrangement has been made. We offer you a basic rule of thumb. If I marry a man who already has three children, the children are a package deal. I didn't choose them. I don't have to love them, but I do have to treat them respectfully and not badmouth them to anyone, most especially not to my husband or to his family. If you feel your stepchildren give you the evil eye, continue to treat them kindly and ask your spouse in private if he can help you with a problem you're having. It seems his children keep giving you the evil eye whenever you walk in the room and also never clear the dishes or say thank you. And you need him to get them to share in whatever chores need to be done. Leave it to him to give them any instructions on what chores to do and on saying thank you to you and being polite. Step parents need to take a very slow route to parenthood first becoming friends of their stepchildren and only gradually assuming an active role in parenting and becoming co-managers with their spouses of their stepchildren. Unfortunately, step parents sometimes get into a competition with their stepchildren, but these relationships should never be viewed as a competition. Couple and parent-child relationships are not on the same hierarchical level. Children often feel jealous that the new partner is stealing their parent, but this is of course not so. The spouse has a necessary prior commitment to his or her children and must fit the couple relationship into that commitment. The step-parent may need to be patient while the parent deals with his or her children first. Remember, if you're having conflicts with your stepchildren or others in your remarried family, the place to start the repair is in your couple relationship. Without that bond, there would be no remarried family. So that is where the relationship needs to be strong to cope with all the other complexities of time, ambiguities of membership and belonging, and the dangling ends of this growing family type. Forming a step family requires a basic revisioning of traditional gender roles as well as family boundaries and membership to provide the flexibility necessary for step family organization. An extended family or community model of family is probably the best model for thinking of a remarried family where children have a whole network of adults who care for them and help to raise them. Families need to develop a system with permeable but workable boundaries around the members of different households, allowing children to belong in multiple homes, to move flexibly between households, and to have open lines of communication between ex-spouses, children, parents, step-parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, and other relatives and kin. Indeed, extended family connections may turn out to be even more important for children in remarried families than they are in first families.